morning, good evening, good, good anything to everybody. Um, I'm Kathleen, I'm the director of Publish What You Pay US. Um, we, uh, thanks, thanks so, so much everyone for, for joining um, and making the time for this, um, for this webinar. Um, I just want to give a brief introduction um, and not take up too much time and then get on to the, to the experts, the brilliance um, of, this, uh, of this real webinar. I just want to kind of situate um, what we're doing here today. Um, so, you know, just explain the context for this webinar. As many of you might know, initial discussions have started um, amongst a number of PWIP members to imagine the ways in which Publish What You, Publish what you Pay can, can and must um, adapt our work in the context of a global energy transition. Um, as a global network focused on exclusively on extractives, um, we feel this is uh, absolutely necessary. So, so far, a small group of coalitions have outlined and discussed initial ideas for a Publish What You Pay global statement on these issues, but also um, potential ways to, to expand and deepen our work. Um, so, scoping um, is more developed relating to oil and gas and then the mining areas of work um, in terms of transition minerals is in the works. These initial discussions have included representatives um, all across the coalition um, from, from many different um, um, regions um, and as well as the secretariat. But, um, but before moving forward on um, the discussions about what we should do and how we should do it, we wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about what it is that we're talking about. Um, so make sure conceptually we're all talking about the same things when we discuss things like, en like energy transition, uh, just transition, uh, and climate justice, for instance, making sure that we're all using the same, uh, we all have the same concepts in mind when we're talking about those different terms. Um, so to inform this discussion about what we should do as PWIP, how we can do it, um, you know, what, 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 what the priority areas of work should be, we um, wanted to uh, roll out this series of webinars. So this is the first of three webinars um, open to the global network in English, French, French and Spanish. Um, so this, this webinar, in this webinar will be um, kind of an introduction to climate change policy and key issues. We will be addressing um, the state of international agreements, current scientific thinking, the human impacts of climate change, policy mechanisms regarding climate change, and a range of scenarios to transition away from fossil fuels. Then next week on June 23rd, we'll have our second webinar where we will discuss the uh, economic governance risks and opportunities for resource rich countries in the face of climate change and a global energy transition. Uh, the presentations will cover the big policy choices regarding extractives and climate change, um, such, as, such as the need to decrease fossil fuel production, the impact of climate-related financial risk on extractive sector policy, how to pursue a just tra transition for citizens and communities dependent on fossil fuels, and which minerals will be needed for the transition, where they are found, and what the implications are for those countries and localities. Finally, our third webinar will be June 30th, and this will be the this will be the beginning of, of the kind of consultation discussion, where we will discuss some of the ideas that um, that we've put forward and um, so far when it comes to potential draft positions that publish what you pay could take, um, and um, kind of initial suggested areas of work um, that we could kind of begin to explore. Um, so if you want to get more involved in the short term and connect with uh, those of us um, kind of exchanging ideas on this and, and helping kind of uh, make this discussion happen, you can get in touch with me or Emily Nickerson um, of PWEB Canada. So um, to get into today, uh, first I want to introdu uh, introduce our wonderful um, uh, and gracious uh, speakers. Um, so first we have Gleda Lan, who's a senior research fellow um, on Energy, Environment, and the Resources Program at Chatham House. We have um, Byron Zamasia, Program Officer for the Zimbabwe, Inter the Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association, ZELA. Mark Campanelli, um, Founder and Executive Chairman of Carbon Tracker. And finally, Kiri Hanks, an Energy Policy Advisor for Oxium Great Britain. <laughs> 
Um, uh, so, and, and just a few housekeeping things before I turn it over to our moderator, Patrick Heller of Natural Resources Govern Natural Resource Governance Institute. Just so everybody knows, Spanish interpretation is available. So you can select the language from the menu at the bottom of your screen. And if you select Spanish, the simultaneous interpretation will begin. Um, please use the Q&A function to pose questions in writing to the speakers. That's how we'll be taking the questions. Um, so you can use that to write in your questions as we go along, and then we'll have all of those for the Q&A session. Um, within that function, if someone has asked a question that you also wanted to ask, um, you can upvote by clicking on the thumbs up um, on their question so that the moderator knows that this is a popular question that many people um, want answered, and then we can make sure to prioritize it. Um, just as a reminder, the formal discussion is scheduled for one hour, but we will extend for 30 minutes for those that can continue um, since, since the, the, the presentations, et, et, et cetera, will, um, will form the bulk of the hour. We want to pro provide some overflow time for, for some good discussion on, and, and answers to those questions. Um, and finally, just um, for, for those who want to engage, please use the chat room. Um, we would love if people could say hello, introduce yourself, um, so we know who the participants are and who's on the call, but then make sure to remember to use the Q&A function specifically for your questions um, for the speakers. Once again, I want to welcome everybody. Um, I can't see you, but welcome um, to this to this webinar. It's 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 a really exciting initiative to be a part of. And um, once again, thanks so much to the speakers and and for Patrick for making the time for this. Um, Patrick, I'll kick it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Kathleen, and thanks to everyone for being with us today. I'm Patrick Heller, as Kathleen said, from Natural Resource Governance Institute. And we at NRGI, like a lot of um, those of you on the call, have been spending some time over the last several months or the last year plus starting to think about what, how to do a better job as an organization in terms of integrating um, the real concerns and the reality of climate change and global energy transition needs into our work on extractive industry governance. And you know, the, 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 I think there's a journey that lots of us on the call are going through, which is that there's really two levels here that matter fundamentally. Obviously, climate change is a fundamental threat to life on planet Earth and all of us as, as humans in it. Um, it also has very significant implications for the work that we all do in trying to promote good governance and justice in the extractive industries in particular. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of this initiative that Emily and Kathleen and the team at, at the Secretariat have put together. What we're gonna try to do, as Kathleen says, over the next couple of weeks, is to try and tie that big picture of climate change and what's happening and what the fundamental needs are as a planet to our own missions as individual organizations and, and as a coalition. And so we're really, we're really grateful to have a fantastic group of speakers with us today. And just to kind of reiterate what Kathleen said, today what we're gonna, how we're starting today or what our goal for starting today is to try and situate the big picture a little bit. So to do a little bit of a um, discussion among all of our expert panelists on what's happening with climate change initiatives at a global level, what are the different possible scenarios in terms of how things might progress or how things might um, regress. Um, and then to start today the conversation about, so what does that mean for resource rich countries themselves? Um, so we're, you know, today we're going to begin with the big picture, but we're, we're going to start to get into the meat of it already over the course of the next hour and then following up as Kathleen said next week to dive dive into some of the more specific policy matters that that we're all working on so I, I, I don't want to take up too much more time from our speakers um, what we'll do is Glada will start first and I'll turn it over to Glada momentarily and Glada's session will situate us a, a, a little bit in, into the world of climate change but in particular um, what the evolution of climate scenarios and climate policy may mean for fossil fuel producing countries in particular. From there, we'll go to Byron. I, I think Byron has been having a little bit of trouble 
getting on the call. So we may we may tweak the order um, if Byron is it takes a little bit of time to join. But just for those of you on the call, Byron will situate the discussion in terms of how climate change policy is evolving within Africa and how global ch climate change policy is impacting African countries in, in particular and, and the voice of those countries in, on the global stage. Then we'll go to Mark, who as part of Carbon Tracker's work has really been looking at what energy transition means for the fossil fuel industry and how companies are reacting how companies should react, maybe how companies are not reacting um, as, uh, as, as the world adapts uh, and what that might mean for the countries in which we work. And then last but not least, Kiri will bring to us a little bit more of the human picture and the, and the fundamental impact that climate change is having on people and vulnerable communities all over the world, including in the countries in which we're all working. And so that, that's a little bit of the agenda for today. Just to kind of second what Kathleen said, as you have questions as they occur during the, Q, during the presentations, um, you can type them right away into the Q&A. We'll probably handle questions at the end, but if something occurs to you, you don't need to wait. You can just type it as it, as it comes. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the speakers. I have told all of our speakers that I, am, I see my principal role here as being one of helping us keep to time. So um, speakers, I will give you a, a, a warning when you have one minute left and then I'll try to cut you off as best we can, not because we don't love you, just because we wanna make sure that we have time to have a very rich discussion. So Gleda, I'll turn it over to you first. Thank you very much. Great, um, yeah, and thank you very much, Kathleen and, and Patrick for the, for the introduction. I'm really delighted to hear that uh, Publish What You Pay is engaging with these issues and, and to hear a little bit about your approach because we've been working with the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative to, uh, you know, they, they invited us to help them think around how they should approach um, energy transition and climate change. So actually today we just launched, uh, or late yesterday, we've just launched a report called Transparency in Transition, which I hope uh, some of you will look up. It's by my colleague, Sean Bradley. Uh, it's on the Chatham House website. So a little plug for that. Um, so it's interesting that uh, I'm giving an introduction of climate change because I have to say, um, years ago when I first started working at Chatham House, I was working on oil and gas and oil and gas governance and national oil companies and I used to go to my colleagues meetings in climate change sometimes and I used to sit in the same office with them and I found it a real struggle to understand, to understand the terminology, to understand the acronyms, because the language, the narrative, the time frame um, in, in which they spoke, in which they held, held debates about climate change were completely different uh, to the world of, of oil and gas and uh, extractors more generally. So just to, just to put that in, you know, just to put my contribution in perspective, um, my colleagues and I were interested in making sure that energy and hydrocarbons and climate change were not siloed, that they came together. Um, so I guess, first of all, a note about the climate science. Let's kind of start with, with the 101. Um, we know that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are causing warming um, and the rise in temperature that we've seen, you probably, many of you have seen the charts that show um, that the last 30 or 40 years is, is a historical anomaly with rising temperatures way over what the averages were before. Um, that correlates with a massive upsurge in the amount of CO2 and other gases that we've been pumping into the atmosphere and of course huge population growth and industrial growth, um, chiefly from burning fossil fuels for energy, but also other gases like methane um, from, from, uh, from food production as well. Um, the thing is about CO2, carbon dioxide, is that its effect is cumulative. And what the climate negotiations did beginning in 1990 was to try and create international cooperation to limit that, the, the effect that they would have on our temperatures and thus on our climate. Um, and we hear a lot about keeping the world within this average of two degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. So pre-industrial levels are talking about the um, 
kind of average temperatures between, I think, 1850 and, and 1900 over what they are today. And, uh, you know, because two degrees is the agreed level at which it is estimated as both achievable and more something that's something manageable however um you know a lot of people are now pushing for 1.5 limit to 1.5 degrees which means something even more radical in terms of the, the way that we um the way that we consume and produce and run our economies we'll come back to that um now we should mention that this idea of an average of two degrees is not in any way sort of business as usual it means you know even two degrees um means more weather extremes entails major disturbance of weather systems we're already seeing that you know even with just the one degree or just over one degree rise that we've, we've witnessed um, over the last hundred years or so so the implications um, of that are only ever inadequately modeled because it's very hard to know how several changes happening at once will interact with each other especially with you know an already felt fast melt melting arctic which is which, which, which plays a, a really large role in our weather systems um, and that disturbing other systems warming ocean currents and air streams um, when they get disturbed that could lead to, to catastrophic impacts on for instance the ability to grow food in certain regions and of course as usual less developed countries are worked it they were often already suffering from environmental degradation um, and they have less resources to cope with calamity. So of course, um, you know, they are, uh, 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 they are part of this conversation, especially about, about especially concerned with, with adaptation and not just mitigation of climate change. Um, so the Paris Agreement in 2015 was really a turning point in terms of, of uh, global collaboration. Um, 190 countries are party to that, the legally binding agreement. Um, to work together to limit that average temperature change to well below two degrees. Um, and the, you know, the, the idea being to then work towards efforts to limit it um, to, to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this would require a momentous effort and, and all countries party to the agreement are committed to submitting Climate action plans in the form of nationally determined contributions (NDCs), and you know that they they were submit the country NDCs were submitted in in 2015, um, but they don't bring us to where we want to be. You know, even if all the NDCs were perfectly implemented, I think the estimate is there were, we would be at around um, a, 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 an average of. of 3.5 degrees of warming so they need to be ratcheted up and the idea is is that you come back to the climate negotiations every year but every five years you take stock on the implementation of these ndcs you report on the implementation and you and you increase the ambition so 2020 is a, is a really important year also now of course we know that the actual um conference of parties the actual negotiations has been postponed uh due due to coronavirus so why is it important for the hydrocarbons industry? Why should it matter to countries looking to use mining and oil and gas production to drive growth? I mean, I think we, when we first started talking about this a um, few years back, uh, of course, historical responsibility looms really large, which is something that the climate negotiations uh, frequently discuss and take on board. If we look at historical responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions, of course, the big ones, the big uh, emitters are the US, the EU countries, China, Russia, India, and Brazil in that order. Um, but at the same time, we know that um, climate change is going to affect everyone. And unfortunately, those um, those who are least responsible obviously might be most affected. And, uh, and so there, there, is a, there was a growing sense that we need to understand, you know, um, uh, who should do what and who should pay for what. And I think one of the big discussions is how they're gonna to get to that uh, $100 billion a year in, in essential 
you know, financing for mitigation and adaptation that was agreed in Paris. We're not anywhere near yet. So I feel that you can chart a, a tangible change in the nature of debates in terms of the ones relating to fossil fuels investment and governance and the ones on the other hand in, in how we how we deal with, with the threat of climate change. One um, minute later. Okay, that's good. Um, and, uh, and and that's, you know, it's really, there's really been a huge change in the last 10 years. Um, there, there literally used to be, you know, two very, very discussions, two very, very different discussions, as I've mentioned. Um, and, you know, you'd often, uh, you have this growing discussion around 2012, around unburnable carbon. So this idea that, of course, if you take climate science to its, to its conclusion, we have literally you know a certain amount of, of carbon that we can burn and various studies have looked at this and said then in that case you know we have to leave um proven reserves in the ground like a third of oil half of gas and over 80 percent of coal that would need to remain completely unburned there just shouldn't be a market for them and that's led um the financial sector to look at really what this means for um, our economies and our exposure to carbon. So the discussion in the financial world is how we get more transparency on this. So there's the, um, the task force on climate related financial disclosure, which was started by the Financial Stability Board under the, under the uh, G20 a few years ago, which is, is, is trying to make mandatory, you know, this um, uh, transparency on, on disclosure of how, uh, how exposed companies and countries are to, um, to high carbon assets and investments. So all this, you know, I, I just want to mention, I know at the end of my time, but just also want to mention that, of course, at the same time, we have this um, rapid increase in the uptake of, of technologies that displace fossil fuels, so renewable energies, storage, efficiency technologies, um, uh, circular economy techniques. And uh, you see a, structurally, a structural decline in fossil fuel demand in the electricity sector in particular, and that shift that people see going from uh, molecules to electrons. So at the same time, I, I just, my, I guess my final point is that um, from the developing country side, uh, whether you've got um, fossil fuels or not, there is this desire to make the best use of the renewable energy resources and, um, and leapfrog in some way the, the, the era of, of, of very carbon intensive industrialization that um, you know, Britain, US, China has gone through. So there are competing narratives here and uh, well, I look forward to, to uh, some deeper questions during the discussion and what that means for producers. Thanks very much, Glade. A fantastic uh, survey, and you're getting us really right into the meat of all of this. Um, we've we've heard from Byron. He's having a, a, a bit of trouble getting on, but he's going to be joining us momentarily. But Mark, if it's okay with you, I'm going to shift sure. shift over to you next as we as 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 Byron gets on. So, Mark, over to you. Yeah, great. Um, I've got host disabled participant screen sharing, so I'd like to share my screen. Who's hosting? If they could enable screen sharing, please. Uh, yeah, I'll do that, or I can um, share for you, Mark. Okay, we do, if you, that's fine. If you want to do that, that's good. So, um, Carbon Tracker, we're a non profit financial think tank. We're funded by foundations. Our goals were set up to uh, help provide information and data, mostly for investors, about their exposure to uh, the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so there's about 25 of us in London and New York. Most of our backgrounds, we've worked for investment banks or fund managers. So we try and be quite technical. If I can move on to uh, slide three, which will be my first slide. And I'm happy to share these slides with everyone, by the way. Um, the key message from this is, yep, emissions from fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels keeps rising. And what this shows you is three lines, one for coal, one for oil, one for gas, um, and how emissions are rising. Most of that um, key turning point was around 1990. And whilst there's a lot of optimism that clean energies are going to reduce the use of fossil fuels, 
key point to note is that these are still on an upward trend and to get to the goals of the Paris Agreement of well below two degrees there will have to be a significant change in uh, what happens to the energy mix and this has, of course has implications for fossil fuel countries. I want to turn to the next slide where we talk about proven reserves of coal, oil and gas and test it against a carbon budget. So a carbon budget is the idea of how much carbon dioxide can be released to the atmosphere, remembering it stays there for a few hundred years uh, before we go through those different warming points. So I'm going to take you to the bottom lines first. The lowest line, which you'll see is declining, that reflects that we emit carbon each year, so the carbon budget drops. That bottom line is 1.5 degrees of warming. The one slightly above it, also declining, is two degrees. And we express them with degrees of probability. So you can have high probabilities, 66%, or lower probabilities of 50%. I know a lot of us on this call would want to have 80% probabilities. But let's look at those vertical bars. The red is the coal, uh, the black is the gas, and the blue is the oil. And it's a fairly obvious statement that the proven reserves of coal, oil, and gas individually or collectively far exceed the remaining carbon budgets two degrees. So just to confirm the point um, that uh, Glader made is that most fossil fuels are gonna have to stay in the ground. Can I have the next slide, please? So countries, um, investors, the banking system have spent a considerable amount of capital uh, building fossil fuel infrastructure. There's 50, 65,000 oil fields, 2 million upstream wells. Of course, there's pipelines that seem for some to stretch around the world, and this costs capital to build and has a value. Uh, for upstream oil and gas, it's about 5.9 trillion, another two and a half for downstream oil and gas, and about 1.2 trillion uh, for coal. That's just the supply infrastructure. Can I move on to the next one? And by the way, we're adding around a trillion a year to building new infrastructure. So we're heading very much in the long, wrong direction. So when we look to fossil fuel usage, <laughs> That's a $22 trillion um, demand infrastructure, of which the largest is road transport. There's um, a, over a billion cars, 400 million uh, commercial vehicles being used globally. Each of those has a figure. And so what you can see we're doing is we're beginning to, can I have the next slide please? We're beginning to add up, add up figures for the value um, of um, uh, the fossil fuel economy. And Carbon Tracker, we published this recently. You can download it from our website, carbontracker.org. It's called da uh, the, the, the Decline and Fall of the Fossil Fuel Industry. Uh, depending on how you measure the numbers, it's somewhere around 30 to $100 trillion of flows of value of physical assets um, that will be fundamentally changing over the next two to three decades. Uh, so the financial markets bit, which I've not gone into too much detail here, uh, $18 trillion of equity capital markets, the value of people's pensions and investments, is represented by the fossil fuel economy, um, and debt is around $8 trillion. Can we have the next slide, please? So how are companies responding to this? Um, well, you would have thought that um, faced with a very rapidly declining carbon budget, the we estimate that we've got a, around a dozen years before we go through one and a half degrees, maybe around 30 or so thereabouts for two degrees. And that's the emissions associated with those levels of warming. Can you just click, click on please? That's what I wanted to see, thank you. Um, most of the scenarios, Exxon, BP, Shell, still have um, scenarios where there's a rapid increase in demand for the use of fossil fuels. And that's why, even with all the announcements around de-intensification, using more gas, maybe buying some uh, wind turbines for their mix, most fossil fuel companies are still investing over 95% of their capex into the development of, yes, more fossil fuels, more oil and gas. And what that does do is increase what we call the stranding risk, the likelihood that a higher percentage of most of these assets uh, will have to be um, left behind. Yesterday, you, many of you were seeing the announcement by PP that they will be writing down $17.5 billion of assets, which they think will be stranded because of lower prices. Can I have the next slide? So what, what is causing this change? Is it climate policy? Uh, well, actually, it's technology. 
Uh, some of it's climate policy, some of it's carbon price, but a lot of this is the steep learning curves. What you're looking at here, or once you look at that sort of gray mass in the middle, which is the operating cost range of already built fossil fuel plants. And based on current trajectories, it's very shortly, uh, it's gonna be cheaper to actually close down your coal-fired power stations and even your gas-fired power stations and build renewables, uh, wind, solar plus storage uh, from scratch. And in most parts of the world, it's already cheaper to build uh, um, renewables with storage than it is to build new coal-fired power or gas-fired power. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we're seeing here, the threat that the industry faces is a series of peaks. So I want to look you to look at the top there. We believe at Carbon Tracker that demand for fossil fuels oil peaked in 2009. For electricity, for fossil fuel generation in 2018, we saw the, the sale of the, um, of the peak year for the sale of internal combustions was, we believe, 2017. The peak year for capital expenditure into more exploration was 2014. The peak for coal was 2013. And as you can see all the way down um, the, the fall of the fossil fuel industry, coal fire power generation in 2007. So what, what markets investors look for is not absolute market share for fossil fuels. They look at who's producing the new growth and throughout the world it's renewables that is taking all the growth. And that's why if we can move to the next slide, um, falling demand from uh, renewables displacing demand has led to falling prices for Brent crude, for thermal coal uh, and for gas. And that's what you're seeing there. And if we can go on to the next slide. And there's a theory that goes, well, actually, um, the transition is going to take so long um, that most market share will be fossil fuels. Of course, investors uh, value will hold up and um, what we think will happen that's represented that theory is represented by that kind of blue line of a steady decline and actually what happens is markets react way before uh, market share does and price peaks before volume and then you'll see these very rapid declines in share prices and if we can move on to the next slide that's basically what we've been seen happening around the world since around 2010 2011 actually probably just around since Carbon Tracker published our first report, um, since then we've seen falling prices, um, share prices in, in this time. So the value of people's investments in coal, oil and gas, relative to that um, line at the top, which represents the S&P 500, the value has collapsed. And most of that has been investors thinking, well, actually, the industry is not as safe as it was. It's got high volatile prices. It's got price competition. Um, it's got new entrants such as Tesla displacing uh, the internal combustion engine. You've got giants of the clean energy satellite Orsted now succeeding and displacing fossil fuel um, generators. Can I go on to the next slide? One minute, Mark. Okay, well, that's great because we've got to the last slide. So what does all this mean? Well, uh, what this means is, is that we think that uh, we've seen peak fossil fuels that um, you can link the technology change and policy to uh, what's happening in markets that investors are already reacting. Uh, there's new competitors that the industry is facing the threat of lower prices. If you can drive your car cheaper than filling your petrol at the pump, then why not get an EV, an electric vehicle? And that the industry, the fossil fuel industry, face higher costs of capital, um, more depreciation and asset write downs. Of course, it's got the cleanup costs. Banks no longer love the sector, um, and it's a wholesale change for um, the fossil fuel industry. Um, is it good enough to solve the climate problem? Um, no, we still need policy. Uh, we need investors to move faster, but what we do know um, is that there's a change is, is happening, and that's reflected through uh, the share price performance of the whole sector. And uh, just a policy, for example, a carbon price will be the death knell of the industry. So it has profound implications for any country that's dependent on fossil fuel rents for their balance of payments, um, and that we're going to be a, see a fundamental shift towards renewables that will disrupt the whole energy sector and transport sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, very much appreciated, and it, uh, quite, quite a you 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 went 
quickly, but with a really comprehensive and fascinating picture of where these markets uh, are, are going. And, and we'll get in more and more into some of what the implications might of that will likely be for all of the countries represented around the, the virtual room. I'm going to kick it over to Kiri now, um, who uh, is going to start to bring us home a little bit in terms of thinking about, okay, so what is, what is, what do all of these trends mean for people and what is it, what do they mean for development and economic justice? So Kiri, over to you. Great, thanks. Let, hi everyone, let me just share my slides and hopefully you can all see that. So um, yeah, so it's great to be with you all. And yeah, exactly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's at stake um, and uh, you can see on this first slide, uh, I love this uh, stunt Oxfam did at one of the climate talks, which basically shows that climate change is, is really a human issue. Um, and I'm going to talk through some of, some of the impacts um, in, in the next six minutes. So, how do I move to that? Yeah, so as Glade has kind of talked about already, um, Climate change is already disastrous for the world's poorest people. Um, and uh, it's the, that's the injustice of climate change is that it, the worst affected are the poorest who have done the least to cause a problem. Um, and that's especially true for uh, the world's small scale farmers who are finding it more and more difficult to live off the land because of these kind of creeping insidious changes in seasons, shorter growing periods, and kind of unpredictable haywire weather which is just it's leaving farmers guessing about um, when to plant what to plant and it just means that you know if, if the rains don't come or if they come too late and of course smallholder farmers are dependent on rain to grow their crops then um, it means no crops and no money um, and another another impact that people often don't, don't think about with climate change is that uh, it, it also impacts women, women and men differently. So with, the, with higher temperatures dragging out drought, that means that women have to walk further to fetch water. And a, another myth with climate change is, that, um, is this idea that uh, impacts are, are far away. And actually, no, climate change is is not some far off threat. Um, the impacts are already in unfolding in front of our eyes. Um, so the FAO um, is, monitors numbers of hungry people every year and actually for the first time numbers have been rising. Um, they've been rising for three years in a row and climate change is one of the key drivers. So it means that a decade of hard-won progress has already been wiped out. Um, and one, one example of, of how this happens is you might remember uh, Cyclone Idai um, last March. It was this, this monster storm that, that ripped through Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, Malawi. And actually a year's worth of rain fell in just a few days. And this uh, unprecedented, very extreme cyclone came on on top of uh, one of the worst droughts in, in a generation. So first farmers lost their crops to drought and then kind of washed, watched them be washed away in the flooding. Um, and another, just another um, thing that is people are starting to, to talk about more and more is this issue of climate, climate induced migration. And um, Oxfam did a study showing that one, one person is forced from their home every two seconds by climate related disasters. So this is just a, a slide to show that, um, you know, just we're all fully focused rightly on, on COVID crisis, but the climate crisis is not on lockdown. Um, and so many vulnerable countries are dealing with, you know, one crisis on top of another. And you might remember a couple of months ago, Cyclone Harold which was a, an unprecedented, very destructive cyclone that ripped through Vanuatu, Fiji, and countries in that region. Um, and one, we know that um, cyclones, climate change is, is increasing the destructive power of cyclones. And so kind of officials 
officials in Fiji were asking, how can we ask people to stay at home when their homes have been blown away? And I also included here um, the, the news about the, the locust emergency. And some of you might be thinking, what, what do locusts have to do with climate change? Um, but actually, um, there, there is a link and um, these, these locust for, swarms are particularly bad at the moment. They're the worst in decades and unusually heavy rains are a factor in that. And they've, these, these unusually heavy rains have led to prime conditions for locusts to both breed and spread more quickly. And we know that locust outbreaks often follow floods and cyclones um, as these bring heavy rains and these are becoming more frequent and severe with climate change. So the, these locust swarms are threatening food supplies for millions of people right now. Uh, it's a very, very concerning situation. Um, and the, the science of attribution, which is uh, to what extent um, climate related disasters uh, can be attributed to climate change, to what extent um, disasters are made worse, or you know, uh, what's, the, what's the size of the fingerprint of climate change in a particular disaster. That science is getting much increasingly um, precise, and that allows us to kind of look at particular disasters and, and say how much, um, how much they were due to climate change. So there's, for example, the, the heat waves in Europe last year in Netherlands and Germany were up to 100 times more likely because of climate change. And they've all, scientists have, already, have also been able to put a figure on um, costs of those climate uh, disasters due to climate change. Um, and I'm just going to, I think, finish with this one slide, which shows um, this 1.5 to stay alive slogan. And this was um, a slogan, well, it was a campaign by, by small island states and the world's most vulnerable countries to, to get governments to agree to, to limit temp, to strive to limit temperatures to 1.5 degrees in Paris. And uh, so this, threshold vulnerable countries see as their kind of survival threshold and all of the impacts i've talked about so far these are the impacts that we're already seeing at one degree of warming um, now and governments have, have come together and agreed to limit temperature rise to well below two degrees and, and strive for 1.5 degrees um, and 1.5 degrees increase in temperature might not sound a lot uh, but it's it's not a safe option and every fraction of a degree of warming matters and it, it makes it more difficult for people to grow food. Um, and the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees is massive. So it could mean an extra 500 million more people in poverty. You know, big differences in crop production in certain regions of the world. For example, um, maize, Southern Africa's staple crop, would become unviable at two degrees of warming. And it's, it's difficult to explain just how much maize dominates life in, in Southern Africa. Um, and of course, at the moment, we're on track to three degrees. Um, and it's not too late to turn this around, but we do just have, we have just 10 years to, to drastically limit the impacts of this crisis. Um, and of course, the more, the more the world warms, the more adaptation costs will increase. Um, and those are costs like um, building sea walls to protect cities from storm surges due to rising sea levels. There are costs like ensuring farmers against losing their harvests from more frequent and severe drought or floods. It, and it's costs for developing new types of seeds that are more drought resistant. And of course, it, it's also the, the costs of, of losses and damages that it's not possible to adapt to. Um, great, I think I might actually stop there. I think I've probably ripped through it too fast. That's great. No, 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 very, very rich um, presentation. I think sets the stage quite, quite well. Thanks so much, Kiri. Um, I, I just wanna check, Byron, are you with us? I don't see Byron's name. I, I, Emily, Kathleen, I guess Byron is still having 
some trouble jump, jumping on. Okay, well, maybe, uh, why don't we proceed with the discussion? And uh, it's, it's a shame Byron has a lot of really interesting perspective to share. Maybe we can figure out a way to, for him to join as a panelist in one of the upcoming sessions if he's not able to jump on today. So let's jump into the, the, the discussion. And just as a reminder on, 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 on the way we're gonna structure it, we're going to take the next 13 minutes and that will be sort of the, the formal session, but we know in these kinds of sessions, there's always more question and more time for discussion um, or, or not enough time for discussion uh, to, to reflect the richness. So for those who wanna stay on afterwards, we'll continue the, the, the conversation uh, for another half hour beyond the formal close. What I'm gonna start with, and not just because Elisa um, is the is the chair of Publish What You Pay, but because her question has, I think, a lot of general applicability and relevance to everybody. I, I, I it, for those of you who don't have your chats open, um, please, I, I recommend you open the Q and A page. And Elisa put a question to Mark that has been upvoted several times um, related to what kinds of information. Um, governments and investors would need to to more adequately assess these risks. Mark, I'm going to turn that question over to you. Do you see Elisa's question in front of you? It just disappeared from my screen. For yeah. Um, well, let's ah, try okay. to answer it um, yeah. directly. So the way Carbon Tracker approaches it, um, I'm not saying we've got the right way, it's just the way that we view it, is that we model all coal, oil and gas production against what we call a cost curve. So which countries are the lowest cost producers, which countries are the highest cost producers? And that because generally speaking, markets tend to um, decide who gets the supply with lowest cost producers succeeding. Now that's not uniformly true, particularly where you've got state monopolies. We give a bias to the lowest cost producers. So we, uh, for oil and gas, um, we have a report which I think I've just posted in one of the answer boxes called Breaking the Habit, which works out which uh, oil and gas projects owned by the majors, such as Shell and Exxon, are, are outside of this cost curve. You also in there have the national oil companies. In the case of coal, we did a report a couple of years ago now, which looked at the lowest cost producers of coal as well. So that's the approach that we take. It's not the only approach, but that's the approach that we take. And, and if you follow that, what it will tend to do is governments will be able to see uh, who's economically viable and who their competitors are. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. I actually wanna put Elisa's question to, to Gleda and Kiri as well, and maybe to broaden it out a little bit. So, you know, Publish What You Pay as a coalition has focused very heavily on transparency and how to get information into the hands of the public so that they can influence decision making in a pro-citizen manner. I'm just interested if either of you has any reflections on that broader question. What kinds of information do citizens need, do governments need, do investors need about climate risks that they're not getting right now? Uh, I think it's a really relevant question for you know the discussions that the coalition is 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 pursuing. Gleda, I see you've taken yourself off, off mute. Do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of fresh in our minds because we've just been grappling with this issue. I mean, it, transparency is incredibly important on the one hand um, for um, uh, making good decisions domestically because you need to know exactly what you have. I mean, the decisions you make are very dependent on the reserves you have, you know, the production time frame, what capacities you have, you know, how carbon intensive your, your fuel is, um, as well as, you know, the kind of investment you're going to need vis-a-vis -vis something else, you know, the opportunity cost, I guess, of investing, continuing to invest in the sector, as opposed to maybe putting that investment or trying to attract that investment into, into some other um, economic activity. Um, so there's some old resource curse issues that I think feature in this debate, and I won't go into them now, but I think you know pretty much what they are, you know, dealing with, with market volatility. But now we've got this added lens where it's not just the volatility, but it's long-term potential decline. And there's big questions about maybe the time frame for diversification. Maybe most countries know now that there is a 
a world um, you know, where, where they will no longer be able to um, drive growth off the back of their resources, but yeah, below ground resources, but you know, how fast do they need to shift into other sectors? I think it's a massive question. And that, that leads on to the question to what infrastructure you build around your sector. You know, I think uh, Simon's asked a question about new producers. I mean, it's a big question on whether they try to um, uh, um, use their resources for green growth, whether that's even possible at the levels of transparency and good governance there to enable them to do that. Or uh, traditionally countries have wanted to use, use um, below ground resources to build um, industries and value chains and create jobs in their domestic economy and maybe you know give subsidies for fuel and things like that as a way to create more equal distribution of what is often a very centralized form of rent which causes all sorts of um, imbalances and distortions in the economy is that still the right route to go down given the problems that it's caused in other countries and given that they'll want to make their own energy transition to and meet their NDC and their other sustainability goals. I think these are some of the areas where transparency can play a really big role because if you know how much state support is going to the sector, you know, you know, you know the cost of the externalities, the, the, the actual emissions and the likely emissions if you go down that route. I mean, there, there's many things that uh, publish what you pay, I think, in, um, EITI can do in partnership with uh, those other groups who are, who are looking at uh, issues of, for example, uh, fossil fuel subsidies that are looking at uh, emissions reporting and inventories. Um, there's definitely opportunities for uh, the sector where, it's, where, you know, where a sector has been established and it's a heavy part of the economy to be a contribution to the NDC, you know, uh, in terms of um, the mitigation commitments that it can make if there is really good transparency and data um, around that. Oh, sorry, and, and one more thing, like on the international no, side, of course, sorry, one more thing, transparency is incredibly important for the, to, you know, in order to, to make this transition fairer and more, um, and more stable and smoother. So I think there are other things, you know, going from country to international level that can help um, uh, uh, to feed into those processes, of, you know, greening the, the financial sector and, and uh, transparency and financial disclosure. Great, thanks, Cleda. Kiri, did you do? Do you want to come in with anything on transparency-related issues? Not, not for now. I think yeah, it's been said already. Great. Okay. Um, so what I what I what I'd like to do is. Maybe just to build on Glada's, uh, Glada referenced Simon's question about the particular challenges to new producers. Um, Mark, I, I, that question was directly addressed to you as well. Any, anything that you want to weigh in? These countries that, are, that have seen themselves as being on an oil-fueled upswing, how do they reflect upon um, uh, these risks and these, these economic challenges? Uh, do you want me to answer that first? Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, see, a lot of the decisions that have been made in recent years were when oil prices were within sort of 70 to $90 a price range. Um, and everyone remembers when oil was at $100 a barrel going to 125 You remember those forecasts? And of course, where it is now is, is uh, you know, trading in the sort of 25 30 to 45 range. Um, and the more demand uh, is destroyed by alternatives and by fuel efficiency standards, um, by electrification of transportation, and by lower demand because people aren't, you know, people aren't going to work um, back to offices because of the coronavirus lockdown. Um, the expectation is that prices will stay lower for longer. Now, what that means is that if you're in a African country and you you're plans were based on oil being at $60 a barrel, and it's in fact at $35 a barrel, then every barrel you produce at that cost, you're losing money, and you're not making the revenues. And so forget climate, it's just a basic economic test. Are you going to make money? Uh, if you're producing at 50, and you're selling at 35, it doesn't take anyone to point out that that's just bad, bad economics, it's bad business, you're going to, you're going to go bankrupt. They all think the market is going to come back, demand will come back. And that's where the real test is. Can we electrify transport, transportation fuels in Africa with people using electric bikes or whatever? 
Uh, is that possible? And that's really what we're going to have to see whether that happens or not. Because of course, there could be a bounce. Um, but the, the trend is clearly not in favor of the industry. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, there's a grouping of questions that are all around kind of the pace and technological um, elements of, of transition, um, how, how long it, the transition is likely to take, Fatima's question, um, Miles's question around, um, oh, I'm losing it, um, the storage challenge for renewables and what implications that might have on the pace of transition. Jamie's question as well about um, energy cost and capacity. I wonder if any of you, uh, if any of the panelists want to want to respond to any of kind of that grouping of questions related to how technology is evolving and what it might mean for the pace of transition. Does anyone want to jump in on those? Okay, maybe I will assign you to jump in on those. Uh, maybe, Glada, maybe I can start with you. The kind of grouping of questions, I mean, you can, you, can, you can pick through the questions as you see fit, but I see that there's kind of a grouping of questions around what's the pace of technological change and what is it likely to mean? What are the implications of that going to be for how quickly or slowly the transition is actually likely to occur? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can see all of them, um, but I'll make a few comments. I mean, um, obviously, I think if you look at projections of, um, you know, from the major, um, the major scenario plotters, the, the International Energy Agency, um, BP, Shell, uh, Exxon, uh, you know, um, the uh, uh, they all they've all underestimated the uh, pace of renewables uptake and EV uh, electric vehicle uptake um, uh, in the last ten years. The costs have come down rapidly. You know, solar by about about eighty percent in the last ten years. Um, uh, storage is, is 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 rapidly coming down as well, and there are more innovative. Um, uh, uh, combinations of technology that I think countries are thinking about putting in place to manage this old uh, intermittency problem that people talk about. So that's still there and it still needs grid up upgrading, you know, it needs extension of grids so that you can um, offset, you know, one renewable source for, for another. Um, there's possibilities of using, you know, water pumping in particular for those countries that have high hydro resources, um, you know, pumping upstream when you've got the solar and using that hydropower uh, at night when it's not when the sun's not shining. So there's a lot of opportunities there. Of course, you need the right regulation, you know, to, to uh, and the right levels of stability um, to attract to attract investment. And I think that's a problem for for a lot of developing countries right now. Uh, they need uh, donors um, and and multilateral development banks to come in with, with, with good systems of guarantees. Um, and I think if that's in place, there are a lot of private investors that want to invest. Um, it, I, I mean, whereas in the discussion yesterday, and it was really interesting that the finance and investment people in the room were so robust on renewables in spite of COVID and the, the impact that's had on, on economies that still want to attract the finance. And, and they, you know, the, the view of fossil fuels is very much that it would have to, you know, projects would have to prove their alignment with the Paris Agreement, you know, with transition, uh, whereas renewables are still seen as you know a really big growth area. Um, and then on top of that, there's so much you can do with infrastructure now. Just the way you plan the city, our urbanisation is a massive issue, and there are ways to plan better so that you're not trapped into a very, very um, high-consuming, wasteful, inefficient infrastructure. It does all take money, so I think that issue of climate finance, green climate finance, and how it's distributed and how countries can access it is one of the big, the big and contentious, contentious topics. Thank you, Glada. Um, Mark or, or Kiri, does either of you want to come in on, on sort of this grouping of questions? Um, pick one again, Patrick. Well, I, I'm 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 thinking of these questions, the 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 couple of questions we have around um, the pace of transition and and technological change. Uh, 
um, you know, Fatima's question kind of summarizes a, 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 or has elements yeah. that tackle a group of questions that we've got. I mean, it depends on what you mean by the pace of change. Do you mean market share? Or do you mean um, how markets, financial markets, which ultimately decide which companies will win and succeed or lose? So it could be that market share will take some time to change, but um, financial markets, which was, I think was the point I was making in my pre presentation, will react far, far quicker than um, how the rest of the world will respond. And, and capital will flow accordingly, which is why, you know, you remember that situation where Amazon was... 20 times bigger than, than Walmart, even though Amazon was hardly turning over anything. And that reflected the fact that the market decided that Amazon would win and Walmart would lose. And you've got the same phenomenon with, um, there's a recent um, battery storage business uh, that's floated on the stock exchange in the US has suddenly become absolutely massive as all the investors have piled in. So, um, you know, the key thing to watch is, is when do markets move? And they will often decide who can raise cheap debt who can raise equity, who gets bankrupted first. Um, and just on the technology adoption, uh, you know, one of the things I often ask in a class is how many people uh, hold a Blackberry uh, in the room? And uh, very often everyone looks at me like, what's a Blackberry? And of course, um, Blackberries, when they're around, they had 50, 60% market share. When the iPhone came in, uh, it didn't go 1%, 2%, 4%, 6%, 8%. It wasn't linear. What happened with, with BlackBerry versus the iPhone? The iPhone went 1%, 7%, 25%, 50%, 60%. And it was game over for BlackBerry in about four years. Everyone remembers that. And I think we have to think of technological change as well. As soon as um, it's cheaper to buy an electric vehicle and run it, it's already cheaper to run it, but it's cheap. If it's as soon as those price points change globally, a locally cheap electric vehicle for the Indian market, the Chinese market, and so on, I think you'll see very rapid um, technological change. And in the case of power, the reason why uh, so much coal is going to get retired early or not used, people are building coal but never using it, is because you've got cheap renewables, particularly uh, solar and wind plus battery storage, is just cutting away margins for, for gas. You've got to transport gas the other side of the world very often as well as coal in the case of sunlight and batteries is, you know, it's physically power it where you want it. And, and uh, it's so much cheaper in many parts of the world. So change could happen faster than people think. Thanks. Um, Kira, did you, do you want to come in on this question? Yeah, I think just, just picking up on, on Josephine's question in particular, cause she's pointing to Myanmar as a country that faces this, you know, on one hand is incredibly vulnerable to climate impacts. It's one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. Um, yeah, on the other hand, is, is the government's kind of exploring, um, extracting, extracting uh, fossil fuels. Yeah, and, and real parallels between that question about Myanmar and the question we got from someone else about Norway, which is also drilling and exploring whilst making strong commitments or, or, or high profile commitments on, right. on climate and environment. So yeah, very interesting your perspective. Um, so, I mean, I... On, on Myanmar and kind of, you know, to very on, talking about developing countries in general, I think it has to be, even though, even though they are, these, Myanmar is very vulnerable at the same time. And, and it's, it is interesting because a lot of these countries are spending, if you look at what share of government budgets actually go to protecting their people from climate impacts to adaptation, it's actually often you find that it's, it's an, it's an incredibly large share, like up to 10% around there of the government budgets being spent on um, coping with, with the impacts of climate change. Um, but I, I think the, the, the arguments that wash are the self-interest arguments. So it is, it is the arguments about what, what kind of investments are sustainable for the future. Thanks, does he, Gleda or Mark, does either of you want to come in on, on kind of that pair of questions, G governments that are drilling or are launching exploration rounds while, um, while also navigating the threat of climate change, um, that balance of global interest versus self-interest, any, re any reflections? Yeah. I think it's something that lots of members of the coalition are really wrestling with. It's, yeah. 
from the way I see it, I mean, it's classic. Every country wants to be last man standing. Every country wants to be the last one selling a barrel of oil or a ton of coal. And uh, so the Paris Climate Agreement doesn't mention fossil fuel production anywhere in it. It's not a supply constraint agreement. It's a demand and emissions reduction agreement. It tries to reduce emissions. It doesn't try and constrain supply. And so you've got this paradox is that during the timing of the signing of the Paris Climate Agreement, countries that were signatories were handing out new exploration licenses as if the two were unrelated. And that's why a number of us um, have come together to form uh, a working group and go to the website fossilfueltreaty.org to create what we're calling a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which will be a global treaty of all countries and companies to negotiate who has the rights to give up production of fossil fuels and it's a series of civil society groups and others working together backed by some philanthropists to develop a, two, a, a global agreement it's divided to two parts one is a, a global registry of who produces the fossil fuels how much carbon dioxide is in the licenses they're handing out that are associated with the reserves um, and um, um, the other part of it is an actual a treaty between governments to agree who should give up um, the fossil fuel use um, and there's a series of academic papers linked with it and there'll be some public webinars in coming weeks so fossilfueltreaty.org um, and um, I, hope I, I hope people can sign on to it or associate the name of their NGO with it you can sign support for the treaty on the website and I think this is the only way this is the only end game that's possible is countries thrash it out and agree who gets to produce the last. And if countries feel that they're losing, there'll have to be, in my view, personal view, some kind of transfer and compensation agreement for countries giving up. Not, um, you know, it's not that we're gonna give money to the Saudis for giving up production rights. So we have to be some kind of, some kind of mechanism that will allow transitioning countries to, to fund their way through, I don't know, special drawing rights through the IMF or something similar. Thanks. I just I, I want to make a note. We've we've passed the one hour mark. We're going to continue the discussion um, for those who want to stay on the line. But as I promised, for those of you who uh, who want or need to jump off, we un we understand. We will uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining. I just want to note for anyone who does have to jump off now that we'll be taking the second webinar in this series next week at this exact same time. So if anyone um, if anyone does need to jump off now before we, we end the discussion, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week and we'll send the link around again as we did uh, for this week's session. So for those who are staying on, I wonder if any of the panelists, you, there's a question from Roderick about um, Paris implementation in Africa um, and how Africa can get finances to actually channel towards their NDC renewal and implementation. D does anyone have any reflections to share on, on that? It was directed directly to you, Gleda, but I think any of the panelists can come in. Uh, I think Kiri should probably answer that one, but um, we do, I mean, we, we actually have a, a, one of our Academy fellows at Chatham House is writing a very interesting paper pointing out you know, the problems that African countries and other, other uh, developing countries have had in accessing climate finance and particularly in accessing it in a way that it's really delivered effectively by national, you know, institutions and civil society. And I think there's definitely need for some reform in that area. Um, we know that there's a lot of money out there, you know, that is wanting to go into green growth initiatives um, I think uh, there's a lot to be done in, in sort of building reputation for the, the stability through through transparency, you know, through um, a, a record basically of, for instance, you know, u utilities being able to to, to pay their, their bills to the to the private power providers and things like that. Um, which and, and and I think the other issue is of course the subsidy reform, which. No one likes to talk about it's such a contentious issue but if you are uh, coming in as an investor in uh, some, some um, green technologies renewable energy or efficiency uh, then you're going to need like a double subsidy if, if the country is already supporting uh, consumption of, of 
of the fossil fuel, which would then make the other technology you know, less competitive. So it, it, that's a big issue for, for countries to reform those in a way that is equitable. I can complement that if you want. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, so there is, in terms of the finance available for NDCs, I mean, there, that is part of the, that is part of the political negotiations, the outcomes of the political negotiations that there is supposed to be climate finance made available, this 100 billion um, from developed countries to who, who are in effect exporting the risks of climate finance, you know, countries that have built their wealth of burning fossil fuels and caused, caused the climate crisis have, are supposed to be paying this 100 billion a year compensation. And that, uh, that of course, is a political figure that's not um, relate, that is not linked to act, and any kinds of needs assessment um, or price tag of, of NDCs. Um, but the idea is that in the future, um, there, that 100 billion will have to be renegotiated um, and the idea is that there'll be that will be part of the cycle of countries recommitting NDCs and, and climate finance pledges you know be, being being made hopefully in connection with that um, but yes yeah, so I, and you absolutely agree that you know that this climate finance is supposed to be additional to aid um, it's not supposed to be. So it's, it, it does recognise that costs of low carbon transition and adapting to climate change are additional costs. So yeah, that, that money is, is supposed to be available. Thanks. Maybe just to add that, you know, post COVID, I guess, recovery packages, there's a real opportunity there for blended finance, you know, coming from uh, domestic sources and international sources could, um, you know, if it's if it's properly planned, it could be very effective in uh, dealing with some of these huge situations. Great, thank you. So I see the one question we haven't addressed yet comes from Isabel related to the political role that oil and gas majors are playing at this moment. Does anyone want to c come in on that one? It's a big question for the coalition. And I'm sure you have views. I don't want to dominate. Does Mark want to come in and then I'll say something afterwards? Yeah, I'm just making a comment that um, according to Influence Map, if you know their work, since the Paris Agreement was signed, the fossil fuel industry has spent something like $2 billion lobbying against the Paris Agreement. Uh, so let's not be fooled. They, they work uh, out in force. Um, the, main, the main thing that um, we're seeing is the companies are announcing what are called de-intensification measures. So they're saying, oh, um, each unit of energy sold is less intensive than last year's, therefore we're going to get aligned with the Paris Agreement. And what they're doing is they're buying some renewable energy, they're increasing gas production, um, so they're, they're kind of less intensive, but overall they're planning to increase absolute production. And so this narrative that the oil industry is, is uh, pushing on, oh, just look at any of the statements from the oil companies. Oh, yeah, we're less intensive is, is leading what, what you would call a false trail. And it's leading people that are otherwise quite smart into believing things which are fundamentally wrong. And we've blogged about this on Carbon Tracker's website. Uh, so um, they, uh, they're trying to give the impression of change without actually having to change anything. And I wouldn't be surprised that if oil prices did go up temporarily again, that some of the oil companies would change and say, okay, we're reinvesting in, in new production where they previously canceled our plans for production. So the other kind of lobbying tactics that they're seeing is trying to persuade investors that their capital investments are somehow Paris aligned. And there's two key groups to look closely at, in my view. One is called Climate Action 100 Plus, which is a $46 trillion coalition that is engaging with the oil and gas industry we, we provide data to it um, and there's a concern that they are not having what you would call a high aspiration exp, uh, ask of the in the oil and gas industry and coal producers and the other group is called the transitions pathway initiative and both of them are under pressure to say the oil and gas companies 
are somehow all of a sudden now Paris aligned so they can carry on investing them. And we should be very careful of, uh, of that narrative succeeding and that anybody who knows how these uh, organizations work, you should try and write to them and ask them to you know, look very closely at the criteria and the, the, the scrutiny they use. If you put even some smart analysts up against the chief execs of Exxon and Shell, um, you know, it's easy to be intimidated by uh, these groups. One of the initiatives I was involved in, that I have some hope for, is the Vatican Oil and Gas Roundtable, where the, Va the Pope met with the chief execs of Chevron and Exxon. Um, and I was there for part of this world, for all of those meetings. And I think there are good actors of which I think in, on this occasion, the Vatican is being a good actor, um, should be encouraged to, you know, to hold the company execs to account for what they're planning to do. Um, yeah, just, just quickly to, um, to add to that, of course, they are in a bit of a crisis, the majors, because they know that they can't sustain their business model, you know, the, the business model of returning uh, profits to the shareholders at the levels that they have been doing, benefiting from, you know, benefiting from volatility in the market, um, but always the prospect of the, the cyclical uh, nature of that and the you know the, the boom and bust um, model and you know unfortunately the um, areas in which they are you know the, the ways in which the IOCs have been um, portraying their own um, diversification you know into renewables it's not going to sustain those levels of profit it's very, very different margins coming from renewables um, it's a completely different industry so uh, I think big questions around um, their future, and, and, and that's a lot of our futures as well because of the way that pension funds have invested in them over the long term. And I think that's where um, uh, the, the issues of the shareholders on what they demand of the companies is very interesting and where else they choose to put their money, which will ultimately define what happens to those companies. Um, I guess, yeah, just to say they have been very powerful players, you know, in, in terms of their uh, access to policy making uh, fora and, and debate um, and continue to be so at the moment. Um, and uh, I, 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 there's a lot of interesting stuff. My colleague Paul, Paul Stevens and uh, John Mitchell have written about the challenges that the climate change poses to them. Watch, and also very different interest to the national oil companies as well. So, as we're getting close to, to the to the end of our session today, I want to ask a final question for all of for all three of, of the panelists, and I'll I'll ask the question, and then I'll share a few of my reflections while while you have a chance to think about uh, my question and and prepare any final words and the question is this so what what we will be doing as a coalition over the course not just of these webinars but over the course of the months to come is to be thinking about how our individual organizations and how publish what you pay more broadly as a coalition can engage or deepen its engagement and deepen all of our engagement around these issues and so the question that I'd like to pose uh, to each of you for some final reflection is um, any thoughts that you have on how Publish What You Pay should think about the work of individual members and the coalition more broadly evolving so as to be as effective as possible um, in advocacy around climate change and energy transition. We know that the coalition will coalition and individual members will be making these decisions. So we're, we, you know, don't be shy about sharing your views. They will be a really valuable input into the discussions that will be happening over the coming months. So while I give all of you a chance to reflect upon that, just to share a couple of final reflections from, from me or major takeaways from this session, I think for me, the most important thing for us to be thinking about as organizations and as a coalition going forward is that the world needs to respond to climate change in a more serious way than, than the planet has been doing so far. And that we don't know what the pace of energy transition will be. Um, but there is some reason to believe that it may be more rapid than um, some would have 
us believe. And I think some of the stuff that Gleda and Mark have been sharing has really shown us that the pace of any of this, of any change of this nature can be unpredictable. Um, and that countries that are dependent upon these resources can't have blinders on, can't have blinders on in terms of the human impacts that climate change is going to have on all of their citizens. And as Kiri said, it's some of the uh, developing countries and in particular tropical developing countries that are facing the most significant impacts um, of climate change on the lives of their people. And so governments can't have blinders on about the effects, but also can't have blinders on about um, the economic impact that this uncertainty and this energy transition will have on countries that remain dependent upon fossil fuels and minerals. And so for all of us as a coalition, I think what we need to do, and it came through very clearly in all of the sessions, is to think about how our campaigns and how our work evolves um, so as to um, help remove the blinders that too many of the governments and places where, where we're working continue to have on. And so I'm hoping that the conversations that will follow across the coalition will help us continue to get more concrete as we think about where to focus and, and, and how to go. So those are my final reflections from today. I want to turn it back over to each of you and I think we'll follow the original, um, the original uh, um, order. Gleda, to you first, any reflections on what all of this means for Publish What You Pay members and Publish What You Pay as a coalition? Thanks. Yeah, um, I guess uh, Richard's report, which I put in the chat, which I hope is, is useful because EITI and uh, a lot and common and uh, I guess one of the recommendations that we made there was 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 a soft one but an important one and it's about inclusion so when you hold your dialogues and and debates and discussions you know make sure it is including the um, the other elements not just the, the the hydrocarbons or the mineral um, sector experts you probably already do that but um, and I don't know how wide your inclusion is but I know that it's a very different discussion when you include for instance ministries of finance and ministries of environment alongside ministries of petroleum um, I know that you know when you widen that to civil society and maybe bring in some groups that are underrepresented and uh, who maybe have interest in the forest the, the fishing the um, you know the, the biodiversity in the country um, you get again a different um, a different, a different level of debate, and maybe when people call out, you know, that uh, well, climate change, you know, is, is a really abstract issue. It's not really in the interest of this country that has very immediate poverty alleviation concerns. You will find uh, some of that, that that dichotomy or some of that conflict is is reduced. Um, I think secondly uh, would be really seeing yourselves in the position of helping helping countries to address information asymmetries. As you, you know, I, I, I don't know how familiar you were with some of the things that Mark said, you know, some of the conversations that are going on in the financial investment world. Um, but usually I think people working in the oil and gas sector and in the mineral sector, they're not usually party to those discussions. And, they, you know, this is a very, you know, some of the narrative is very alien to them. So I think bringing some of that in, and it's because ultimately investment trends will, will affect uh, you know, um, um, what they're able to do with their resources and what market is available for them. So um, to, to help to address some of those asymmetries would be, um, I think, a, a really key role that, that you could play. Thanks very much, Gleda. Much appreciated. Mark, over to you. Yeah, no, thanks for the conversation. Um, I've enjoyed listening to you know, these different perspectives on it. Um, I keep thinking that the energy transition in the next two decades, three decades, is going to be require such a fundamental shift to the global economy. We should, we should have started planning for it 20 years ago. And of course, we, we didn't. And we, we're starting from where we are. Um, our main message is that if you can't burn the fossil fuels that have already been financed, why, why are markets still pouring capital, a trillion dollars a year, into building new fossil fuel infrastructure like pipelines and mines and, and so on? Um, and that we all of this will have to be reviewed. Bankers and regulators are a good place to start to get uh, companies rethinking these plans. That's why the role of investors is so important. Um, where we need to get companies is to produce what we call Paris aligned business plans. Now, what does that mean? What it basically means is a 
orderly wind down of current production and means transition plans to say we're halving production of coal, oil and gas to meet the goals of the Paris objectives and that we need to then rethink our whole energy systems and design for the clean energy revolution. Now, the good news is clean energy is cheap. In most parts, if not all parts of the world, is scalable, it creates jobs. 80% of the world's populations live in energy importing countries. The clean energy transition is going to shift capital from rich countries, typically run by oligarchs, to poorer countries. And you know, it's a figure I used before, but India spends $60 billion a year on oil imports. Now imagine what energy to in independence will mean for a country like India. They don't have to find dollars. 60 billion dollars to pay for it they'll be able to use that generating their own energy um, local energy with local jobs and so there'll be a redistribution of wealth so they're going to be more winners from this transition than losers but that doesn't help um, some countries that are planning on a fossil fuel future to get themselves out of poverty and there we need to plan and think very carefully about what the transition will mean and i and, uh, you know, the, the work and support of people around the just transition is vitally important. Uh, so as we wind down fossil fuel production, we then have to scale up new jobs and green production and the green economy. It could be, here's a thought, if we're powering, you know, car manufacturer close to uh, sunlight, sunlit areas where we can put solar and batteries, it could be that, you know, the equator countries, Tanzania and Uganda and all the equator countries could end up being the manufacturing plants of the world for a, an industrial revolution built around solar. Doesn't We don't have to have an industrial revolution in the north. It could be we move industry to the south, to where the sun, cheap sunlight is, and we export cars and other manufactured goods from cheap energy from those countries. So we, we, we can even rethink that in the energy revolution. And we should be thinking about that, not just about will fossil fuels make us a buck in the next 10 years on it. Well, so that's the wrong way to be thinking about it. Thank you, Mark. Kiri, over to you. I think the only thing I'd, I'd add uh, is that I think that this, conversa this conversation has been very uh, separate in the past between civil society working on climate impacts, climate change, and civil society doing the kind of watchdog and transparency role that your network does. And the more we can join together, the better. Um, and so I would, I think um, you may already be members of, of Climate Action Network, this big umbrella climate network, but uh, I think they, they re if you're not, they really do need your voices in there to kind of bring the perspective of, of resource dependent countries and, and kind of so we can together grapple with what's a kind of equitable and just way forward. Fantastic. Well, um, on behalf of everyone around the virtual room, I want to extend a, a tremendous thanks to our three panelists. Um, very much appreciate your insights and your expertise. And I can speak, I think, on behalf of the organizers of the call and saying that we will draw upon that expertise and, and your perspectives going forward as the coalition's positions on this continue to evolve and build. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining. I'm gonna turn it back over to Kathleen just to bring us home and, uh, and to get us prepared for next week as well. So thank you very much. Sure, sure thanks Patrick. Yeah, just to be brief, um, Thanks again to all the speakers as well as Patrick um, and everyone for attending. You know, I think it's 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 vitally important that we have this conversation, as I hope everyone agrees even more after this webinar. Um, um, you know, I think that we, there's many of us who believe that we absolutely, as PUF, are humongous global architecture. We do have a role to play. I don't necessarily like to think of it as PWIP working on climate change. I think it's just, you know, how PWIP, PWIP must, uh, should and must adapt its work. Um, to contribute to climate justice and address the transition. So next week, um, like we said, we're going to have another webinar and where we start to focus on some of the economic um, and governance um, issues related to address transition now that we have the groundwork that was laid by the experts on this call. So please do join next week. Um, um, and also please, um, like I said, get in contact with myself, the Secretary, or Emily Nickerson, if you would like to get involved in the small group of us who are uh, you know, sweating, trying to get through some of these really big questions and issues together um, to try to help uh, 
you know, uh, progress the conversation within Publish What You Pay based on a lot of these concepts um, introduced today on how we could potentially start to engage more um, and work on these issues. So please do, um, if you're interested in getting more involved, reach out to us. We need absolutely all the help we can get. Uh, thanks so much, everyone.